on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I still can't believe none of us got COVID. No. As far as we know, nobody has told us that they got COVID after the event. And there were, you know, 600 people there and the boat probably had 300 people on it. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't really have a more uh, effective Petri dish. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello. It is episode 300. Can you believe that, Mark? 300. And 52 into 300 is loads. It's like a decade or something. Six, I don't know how good my math Six is. years, I think, James. Yeah, so that's, um, that's pretty good going. That's nearly six years. We had one or two weeks where we did uh, multiple episodes, but um, that is incredible. It's gone, gone past really quickly and the industry's changed a lot. So what we're going to do in this episode is Mark and I have picked out some favorite moments over those 300 episodes. We're going to play them as clips. It's like the highlight show when they ran out of ideas on Friends, um, but we haven't run out of ideas. This is our big idea. I also have a very special look behind the scenes at the self-publishing show. As I hinted at last week, there's a team of people who put this show together. And a couple of people have asked us how we actually do put it together. So a little video at the end of this episode is going to show you exactly how it all goes together. And you get to see everyone behind the scenes. Apart from, I think, John Dyer didn't include himself in the video that he sent me. It's probably best. He's an enigmatic guy. It's John, dark. That's the thing. It's dark in the cellar as well. So he'd have had to switch the lights on it or, is. you know. All yeah, that, so. we should. I, now it's episode three hundred. We should should think about when we're going to let him out. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> After the last couple of years, you know, with COVID, I'm not sure the world is ready no. for another trauma. So, no, we might want to wait a bit. That's true. Okay, one quick thing: we have some free training for you. That is a webinar with Mark Dawson himself. Uh, a brilliant webinar, actually. If you're getting started with your uh, publication business about how to get your first 10 reviews or your next 10 reviews if you're low on reviews and it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because it really helps sales but without sales how do you get reviews well uh, we have 10 uh, really good ideas for you to get your reviews going uh, you can join us for that free training on the 20th of October Wednesday that's next Wednesday the 20th of October it'll be at 9 p.m UK which is something like 4 or 5 p.m in New York you'll have to check those uh, those times uh, they'll be in the registration email if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash get reviews or one word selfpublishingformula.com forward slash get reviews join us for that live webinar on how to get your first 10 reviews okay look we are going to start with episode number 150 this is a milestone episode for us but it was a milestone episode for mark in particular so two things that we did for this episode one is we rebranded from the old self-publishing formula podcast to the self-publishing show and mark had a big financial announcement this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer we started at the tail end of the pioneer phase i guess we're still in the pioneer phase of indie but when there was a you know a few people who were pioneering and working out how to do this and in a few short years indie publishing has transformed into a billion dollar industry it still feels the same sweet supportive uh, environment which is great but it is a, a fantastically vibrant and exciting and I hate to use the word, but I'm going to use the word transformative um, industry now. And we want our show to be at the heart of that. We do. Absolutely. Yeah. The ethos is the same, but the opportunities are, are much greater now than they were when I started out. Yeah. Which sort of brings us on to this episode. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to talk a bit about you, Mark, and uh, what you do and how you do it and how you got there. And that all comes from... A post that you put into the uh, Facebook group. We have a community Facebook group, uh, which I know most of you will be a member of. Uh, of course, uh, you can just search for self-publishing formula on Facebook and you will find it. And last night you reached a landmark and you posted in a screen grab of your KDP dashboard. And at the top of that were your year to date earnings from the 1st of January 2018. And it was, if I remember rightly, $1 million. So you're a seven figure a year author now. How does that feel? A bit weird, to be honest. Um, it, it's it's also it's pretty nuts. I you know <clears throat> I'm very flattered and surprised and 
feel quite lucky to be in this position um and was was very flattered by the uh by the support that i got from the community when i posted that into the into the group last night it was really really lovely um but it was yes it was fun it was a fun evening i spent um dinner with lucy and her mum and her and her husband uh with my phone out basically refreshing it every five minutes which was kind of what i used to do back in the day just waiting for that to tick over to go from it seemed to be stuck on nine hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars for quite a long time and then um around about 10 o'clock it ticked over i grabbed grabbed the screen and posted into the group um and yeah it, it's and then i had a very good day yesterday I mean, yesterday i did uh, nearly three and a half thousand dollars worth of sales yesterday which was the best for ages um since the September slowdown. So really, really pleased to be able to have uh, kind of crossed the line triumphantly. And now uh, three weeks left to go. Just wonder how, you know, how much further I can push it this year. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go, Mark. So we became the self publishing show. And uh, if I remember rightly, we grabbed it from the self publishing podcast people. They released the domain without noticing. And I, I, Nicked it. I didn't realize I'd stolen it off them. I was just Googling one day and I think I remember saying to you, do you know the self publishing show.com is available? And you said, grab it. And it turned out in a conversation with Johnny, I think later he said, I think I released that by mistake. Anyway, losers, snoozers. Um, uh, love those guys. Uh, we also, of course, in that episode, marked your first $1 million year, which is a big year for you personally but also i think for the rest of us in the industry looking on at the the people forging ahead is a very important milestone for us and can you still remember that so i don't know how many years in a row now it must be four years i suppose um no i remember that very well when it ticked over from six figures to seven figures it was in november and i knew it was coming and i was kind of looking at the book report and refreshing it and waiting for an extra two or three dollars or one more sale to go through and it did, and it was uh, yeah, a pretty surreal moment, and still, it still feels quite weird to be honest to to be doing that. And as we, we said just off off camera before we recorded, I was in London last night to see um, some uh, some lawyer friends. I as I I was a lawyer originally, as I've said before, and twenty five years ago was when I started. Um, so I saw some of these um, the, these trainees that I haven't seen for twenty two, twenty three years in some cases. And most of them are still lawyers, um, which would have been my fate too, probably if I hadn't um, if I hadn't found that this the self publishing was something that you could make a, a good living out of. Um, so I'm still incredibly grateful for the opportunities that, that that's given given me. And and of course we see it all the time in the community with other authors you know, leaving their jobs and uh, retiring their spouses. And we'll we'll hear from one of those later. <laughs> Do you know, thinking about it, um, the you know, how many traditionally published authors make a million dollars a year? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I think we could we could probably have established someone like um, Data Guy, uh, who I think we've had on the podcast, haven't we? Yeah. Um, he, yeah. I won't say his name because I think he's still slightly um, secretive about that. But I, he would be able to work out, roughly speaking, how many um, copies were being sold. But that only, only counts the online stuff on Amazon. So when it comes to... Um, stores and things like that it's a bit more difficult to work out so I don't know no, probably not that many to be honest I, I'd, mm. I'd be quite surprised if apart from the obvious ones so you know the George R. Martins the Lee Charles Cameron Slaughters people like that beyond that it's I don't know probably not a huge amount but it would be interesting it would be interesting to, to, to find that out one day yeah it would be interesting it's all secret I mean Amazon keeps a lot of its figures secret stuff, some stuff does come out but um you know, they do work in a different way. The trade industry it is still very geared around physical books, which, by the way, have had a pretty decent 12 months. So grown, raised, there's been um, several rises published, uh, publicized in the papers for sales of physical books. And they make more money per book. And I think publishing companies have, you know, their sort of integrations with, with printers and so on. So there's money to be made along that trail. But the author ultimately doesn't get much of that. You know, they still are stuck at this a fairly low percentage cut. So you still have to shift a lot of books. Um, and we've had a couple of authors on, we've had several authors uh, who've been through the trad process and, and then entered indie who, who don't have a lot of good things to say about the financial rewards available to traditional authors. But having said that, of course, there's the household names who, who do make squillions and at some point get to write their own contract, I guess, to, um, uh, for publishing companies to retain them. But yeah, well done, Mark. And uh, as you said, you've gone on from strength to strength. 
since that first one million year. I think I'm going. I might have a a, a four figure year this year, which is um, well, three. Uh, it's got to yeah. start somewhere. That was. I'm not sure what my first year would have been, but probably not that much. Not that much different from that, to be honest. Yeah, I, I might just creep into that, which would be great. Um, and I was thinking today. I'm sort of probably just over halfway through my first draft. I've really had to take my foot off the gas for the last six weeks or so. It's been colossally busy here, one thing and another. But I'm back on it now. And I was thinking this morning, I need to get this done because I think I can be in profit with two books. But all the evidence I'm looking at with book one, which is break even or small profit, in, in, you know, all it takes is a percentage of those people to read book two. And that should be profit for me mm -hmm. without having to advertise book two separately. So. <clears throat> And uh, just want another little note for Fuse Books, which is the books that uh, Mark and I market for other people, uh, is I got an email this morning uh, awarding a Kindle Unlimited All-Star bonus to, um, uh, to one of our authors, Kerry Donovan, uh, which was exciting. I've never seen one of those emails before. Of course, you will have seen them, I'm sure, Mark. How often do you get an All-Star bonus? Every month. Every month, okay. But it's only <laughs> it's only the top 100 authors in KU in the UK, isn't it? It's or? well, it's UK, US, and Germany um, are the, where they run that that program. And it, yeah, it's a top. There's a, there's a variety of different awards. So top 100 authors in terms of page reads, um, and then there's there are also awards for books in terms of the books that have the the most page reads as well. So yeah, it was good, very good to see Kerry get that. I mean, I think it was at the lower end. I think that he it's probably the lowest of the awards but that's his first time yeah. getting that um so and he never got it before that that's for sure so it's it's um just a testament to the fact that it's working you know the new covers the new blurbs and more importantly the ads that we're running on those books or the, the first book really it's definitely working okay he's a good writer too so you obviously can't take that away but it's um it's a combination of good writing and good marketing and and we're seeing the results with, with him doing really well yeah well done carrie and well done us. Okay, let's move on to our next clip. We are going back uh, 18 months or so to March 2020 in the uh, when the virus was just a, a whisper in the news at the time and we held our very first self-publishing show live in London. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Let's do it. Conference took place today. It was incredible. We covered non-fiction, authors making 50 to 100k a year. Joe Penn talking about all the other ways of making a living, not just selling books. And we had inspirational moments from people like Louise Ross and Mark Dawson about how they got to where they are today. And now, we are on a Mississippi paddle steamer on the River Thames. This is quite an important part of the day because this is where people get to meet their buddies. Future partners are going to help them navigate their self-publishing careers. The yeah, personal highlight for me was actually seeing Mark in person because he is the kind of personality behind it. If you sign up for the course, you get his videos, you hear his voice, but actually to see them. And, you know, they're not precious. They're just wandering around buying drinks, chatting with people. We love events that help indies learn new techniques and new strategies they can use to help their business. We especially were excited about this one because Europe has so few conferences for indies and just such a great lineup of speakers. For me, this is just a great opportunity to, to learn and just listening to everyone's piece of advice. I just think you've got to keep your ears open. Being here at the show, meeting other authors who have had success in both the non-fiction and the fiction fields has been really inspiring. All the speakers was great. At halftime, I told John Dyer that he can open the champagne bottles because it looked like this will be a success. When I looked around, I saw lots of happy faces. I think it was awesome, really, and I will definitely come back next year. I think it's really nice that it's a bespoke event for indie authors rather than something that's muddling together things that are for traditional publishing and for people that might be interested in independent publishing as well. There is no better way to create a relationship than to rub elbows with somebody. Everybody at these events, everybody that's part of SPS has a great spirit, they're willing to communicate, they're here to actually support each other. You need to be here in order to make those relationships, they will last you the rest of your career. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Man, that was fun. God, I really enjoyed it. And I was watch. I watched the video um, ahead of this this 
recording and just reminded me how what an energy buzz it was to have so many friends in the room um, all doing the same thing and people who listen to this show regularly being in person it was so so much fun and uh, I can't wait to do it again yeah it was a lot of fun I would also we should give Catherine a bit of a shout out because Catherine was very important in the organization of that which is you know if, you, if you've not done organize an event for up to a thousand people before it's there's quite a lot of work to be done um and so she did a great job it was a really good day um and quite tense as well for us because it was um the ninth i think it was the ninth was it the third of march or the ninth of march can't remember ninth of march i think ninth, it's right it's right march. on the cusp yeah, of everything monday the ninth and then the friday of that week was the uk lockdown announced um so we we just slipped it through and, and we didn't know whether we could do it i mean obviously we we followed uh, all, all, you know, the government's advice, and, and we were it was okay to do it. The, the, the venue were happy to do it, um, but it was still quite nervy for us because I don't know. We may not have got money back if we'd had to cancel. You know, there's all kinds of things that we're um, thinking about, and it, and it, and it's it's a big undertaking, both financially and also in terms of the organisation that we had to do. But it went really well. Uh, we had a lovely time um, from you coming on in your uh, hazmat suit, which. Perhaps a bit too early. I'm not quite sure that was, <laughs> if we chose too that soon. quite quite right. Um, and yeah, lots of good speakers, uh, great energy. And then, of course, we had the the boat trip afterwards, which was um, I still can't believe none of us got COVID. No, I don't know. How, well, as far as we know, nobody and nobody has told us that they got COVID after after the event. And there were you know 600 people there, and the boat probably had 300 people on it. You couldn't yeah. you couldn't really had a more uh, effective petri dish for an mm. airborne pathogen to uh, infect lots of people, especially people like us who were kind of lots of people buzzing around and wanting to say hello. So it was, yeah, it was it was a great event, and I'm quite pleased we we all got through it unscathed. And and looking forward, hopefully, touch wood to doing it next year. Yeah, yeah, we would love to. Um, so, uh, but uh, we're still sort of in the, t- well, hopefully we're in the tail end of this thing and it's still too early to organise uh, anything. But you'll be the first to know listening to this show if we're going to do it again live. It would be lovely to see you. Try and do it maybe over two days so people can really make a, a mm-hmm. good fist of it and, and try and increase the numbers a bit as well. We, we had a look around the venue while we were there and uh, I think next time we would try and book out the whole venue. There's a smaller theatre next door so we could have more bespoke, you know, maybe big theatre for foundational stuff and smaller theatre for more in-depth learning, something like that. Anyway, that's all in the uh, the melting pot at the moment. Okay, next clip we have chosen uh, with lots and lots of interviewees. Um, you know, I, I, whilst it is on the one hand a bit of a treadmill, you know, doing the interviews every week and, and recording these raps and you'll see in the in the video at the end of this, uh, this programme what goes into just a single episode. Um, it's also... A, a treat for me uh, to sit down for 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour uh, with people with different life experiences and backgrounds and, and talk to them. I've grown hugely, I think, through that, not just in writing, but listening to people from different um, different life experiences. And we've pulled out just a couple really for today. And the one we've pulled out actually is Lucy Score, who we've had on the podcast a couple of times. Uh, I love Lucy. Uh, she's become a friend of mine, but... I think what we are both attracted to about Lucy is is her story of this sort of classic kind of I don't know almost like working girl you know working along in a, a job she didn't particularly like but you know like a did. what working girl at the film yeah, it's a you film know, reference I know what a working girl is that's not what you mean <laughs> <laughs> it's a film reference it's not a prostitute oh, okay. reference although All you right. know I'm not you know I'm not I, I don't disparage people for their job choices Mark like you do. Um, <laughs> Yes, Working Girl, the film, Melanie Griffith. Do you remember? Mm, it's I like do, a, I do. a pipe dream type thing. So you're going along in your nine to five, um, but she she makes things happen for herself, uh, Lucy. And this began with her writing brilliant books, hitting number one in the Kindle store uh, the same week that they fired her because she was honest enough to say to them, look, I do, I do write books in the evening. And they were really shitty about it. And she hasn't looked back. And I think in those early days, she was being published by somebody else and sort of shared the profits with them. And she is now the publisher of other people. And uh, I love her to death. Her and Tim, Mr. Lucy, do a brilliant job uh, publishing hers. Let's hear from Lucy. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Accountants 
these accountants were a little on the conservative side, so I didn't tell them that I was writing romance in my spare time. And, but it did start to leak at work. Some of my coworkers found out and secrets just don't keep in small companies. So right. I, felt, I felt guilty for hiding it. So I went to one of my bosses on a Monday and I confessed. I said, I just wanted to let you know, I have this hobby on the side. My second book is coming out this week. I just wanted you to know. And she's like, good for you, that's great. So that was a Monday. And then on a Wednesday, they called me into the conference room and fired me. <laughs> It's unbelievable. I, they, they were shutting down my department and um, they gave me until the end of the year to find a new job. And I was devastated. I, there goes my five-year plan. Now I'm going to have to stop what I'm doing writing-wise and work on my resume, find a new job. You know, this resets everything. So the very next day, my book came out and did astronomically well. Um, it it just shot up the charts. It hit number one on Amazon in the Kindle store. And in the whole Kindle store? In the whole Kindle wow. store, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't expect it, especially not after how the first novel did. Uh, so this was a big surprise. And I didn't, I didn't have access to the sales numbers, so I didn't quite grasp how big number one was. And I was still, in my mind, thinking, I still, I gotta get a job, I need to work on my resume. And uh, we did a conference call with one of the publishers. And she was like, you need to quit your job now. And I was like, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't quit my job. I need, I need to pay my bills. And uh, she said, we'll give you an advance for what you've earned so far this month. And I was like, well, what's, the, what's that going to be? And she named my entire annual salary. And I was like, I will quit tomorrow. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, do you remember what you did that first month? Are you happy to share that? Sure. Um, my cut, well, they were giving me an advance on the first, like, two weeks. Yeah, I forget how that actually went. They're, yeah. They gave me, I had a $40,000 advance from them, and that wasn't even a month of royalty, of so my that's, cut of that's the royalties. 50% of the profit. Mm -hmm. Or you spent, yeah, so, so at that point you'd had $80,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we ended that first month with, because uh, we were on a 50-50 royalty split, so I believe total it was $200,000 for the month. Wow. With one, well, two books, but yeah, basically all down to one book. Yes, because that book did so well, um, my first book ended up in the top 10 of Amazon okay. also. So, that was crazy. Well, what a <laughs> great writer you must be. I do feel like I am an That's excellent like writer. <laughs> this is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. I mean, there are... There are lots of people uh, who we've interviewed and lots of interviews have had quite an impact on me and I know listeners um, when we see all the comments and emails afterwards. So we can't pick out all of them for this episode, but we picked out Lucy as a bit of inspiration and uh, well done her. Yeah, she's done great. And, and, and obviously, as you said, that she's not the only one we've, we've um, I was looking through the testimonial videos we have as 101 is launching at the, as we record this and um just looking at the testimonial videos and they were must they must have been 30 now that, we, that we've done all, all all different kinds of people at different stages um when they when they recorded the testimonial and, and then when they've subsequently continued to do really well people like i saw imogen clark had posted today um one of the ads that we're running at the moment she posted a comment saying you know, since she recorded the testimony, she's been number one in the Amazon UK store seven times, something along those lines. So it's kind of, it isn't just a flash in the pan. A lot of these authors like Lucy have completely consolidated themselves as successful authors making a lot of money. Um, I mean, Lucy will do, is doing a lot better than me. Um, that's, and that's brilliant. I, I'm thrilled to bits to see those, those kinds of success stories. And um, it's, it's one of the loveliest things that we, you know, we have been able to play a small part in, in some of those authors going from, you know, jobs they didn't like particularly to having this amazing life as, as, as a full-time author. Yeah. There's no way around it, really. You can't sleepwalk into that sort of success. If you talk to Lucy and Mr. Lucy, um, they will talk straight away in some detail about their ads, what's working, what's not, their newsletter frequency, how they manage everything. And there's no way around. You have a lot to learn. Uh, to get this right, but the people who who can write and then put that sort of effort into the marketing side, 
get justly rewarded. It's it's a land of opportunity at the moment. And still, we still stand by that, that Huey Morgan says in the opening intro, there's never been a better time to be a writer. No, clear, clearly um, it's, there have been more opportunities. As, you know, even during the pandemic, as, as we've spoken about before, people were reading more. Um, so, you know, more more readers out there, perhaps coming back to reading for the first time in, in years, and they want that, and they won't stop. You know, if, if you've, I've, I've I've introduced the Milton books to people over the pandemic, and I know because I've got emails, they've they've read all twenty, um, and so that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, a couple more clips to come on this anniversary episode, number 300. Uh, and this one is another interview. And I suppose it's the biggest name we've had on here, uh, which is Lee Child. He's, a, he, he's one of these authors who becomes a byword for writing. You know, people talk about th- genre writers. Often Lee Child is the example they come up with. A British guy brought up in the Midlands here in the UK, but moved to the States, thinks he lives in the East Coast, somewhere north of New York uh, now and um, has a great story behind him and does a brilliant job in sort of leading that. I almost feel he invented that sort of slightly modern feeling guy um, character in terms of Jack Reacher, who so many people have emulated. So here's, uh, here's Lee Child. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. I mean, you are a superstar in the thriller genre now. It's difficult to have a conversation about thriller writing without somebody referencing you now. Is writing a book today, does it feel different to you than writing it before you were so well known? It does in a way because, as I said, I was looking to make a living and so it was a kind of financial contract at the very beginning. Now it's an emotional contract between me and the reader. They want to have another Reacher book next year and I would hate to let them down. And so I do it as well as I can and hope they like it. But that's not the sole reason you do it for, I mean, do you still enjoy the writing process or is there an added pressure now that doesn't make it quite as enjoyable for you? There's an added pressure definitely because of so many people's expectations, but you can, you can dodge that really and write for yourself. I mean, that's really the only way to do it. And so the actual writing process, yeah, I love it. Um, it's a joy just to sit down and mechanically, you know, if there's a great sentence, you feel proud of it. I, I love the process. The rest of it, the uh, promotion and the traveling and all of that kind of thing, uh, in itself, that's horrible because it's such a, you know, it's such a bore now traveling. But when you get to meet the readers, that's great. So it's worth it. Yeah. And uh, you talk a lot, of, you've spoken about your process in the past. I think you still do this thing where you start on the day of your redundancy from Granada. So yeah, that- first of September, I start every year. Partly because you've got to have some structure in your year. You know, if you, if you put it up until you felt like it, you would probably never do it. Um, my final question is, there's a growing number of independent authors now. Um, do you have a view on the sort of movement and the changes that are taking place in publishing? Um, I was very excited about the self-publishing thing. You know, it's a bit over 10 years now that it's been around. Um, I thought it was a tremendous uh, coup, really, a really democratizing uh, stroke. Really unique in artistic history, if you think about it. Suddenly, something was available to everybody, where before it had been highly selective. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. I do feel I was a bit nervous meeting Lee, and we should have... um... I should have been a little more slow and pacier, uh, less pacier uh, in that interview. But there you go. I was nervous. In the, actually, the interview I think I preferred more because I did a better job of it. And he was such a nice guy. Although Lee Charles was a nice, nice guy. Uh, it was Harlan Har- Harlan Cope. Har- oh God, I can't say his You're name. Right. Harlan Coben. Yes. <laughs> Harlan Coben. No. Yes. Har- Harlan Coben, not Carlin Hoven. <laughs> no. <laughs> Harlan Coben, um, who my dad's a big fan of uh, and writes, uh, reads all, everything he does, and he was mm. a really interesting guy to talk to. Lee Child's such an interesting guy. I remember, I remember John Dyer and I turning up at Thriller Fest in New York the day before the conference, and the hotel had no, no all the rooms. We walked around to see where we were going to film and and so on, and there was no no delegates there. The rooms were being set up. And then we saw a, f- a group of people standing around talking. There was this very tall guy smoking, very thin, tall guy. And, and John and I went straight away, my God, that's Lee Child. And he was just standing having a meeting. I think he was part of the kind of... Um, he was on the board, know, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the board that year. And so, um, yeah, he smokes like a trooper. He's thin as a rake, very tall, very sort of distinctive, but the most laid back guy you'll ever speak to. And what what an achievement he's he's had. 
Yeah, why is he so laid back? Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> he smokes the millions. He, he smokes, no, he smokes a lot of weed. He, oh, he's right. A, so he's, he's a he's massive, <laughs> he's a massive smoker. Um, so no, he, he's so he's done. We don't need to um, burnish his halo. He's he's done an incredible job. I think it's something like one reach a book is sold every twenty seconds or something along those lines. So he's he's great. Um, you know, lovely guy. Very, you know, very very kind of relaxed. And step back since we recorded it. He's obviously he's not writing those books anymore. So he's um. I think probably, I don't know this to be true for a fact, but I think it's quite likely he hasn't been writing the Reacher books for at least a couple of books before they announced he'd handed those over to his brother, Andrew. Um, so, yeah, they, they, and now if you look at the, the Reacher books, it's it's Lee Lee Child in, in you know, larger type with Andrew Child, um, his brother. Ne- ne- by the way, neither of whom are called Child. No, he's, he's Jim Grant, his name is. Um yeah. So, um, and why is Reacher called Reacher? I think we've probably mentioned this before. Do you yeah, remember, do you know? because he's so tall, and his wife nicknamed it because he was always being asked in shops to reach yeah. up for products was, for people. He was the Reacher. Yeah, he was the Reacher. Yeah. And John Milton, you used uh, Lee Child as a bit of a um, an advertising um, line, mm-hmm. and we do also with uh, Ryan Kane for Kerry Donovan, and we're not the only people who do that. When you started writing John Milton, was it very Particularly influenced and inspired by Jack Reach, or no, was it a coincidence not, that it's similar? not really, not really. I mean, I, I was more. I mean, you, you, the Reach character, the, that that um, avatar is not original, um, and and he would be the first to say that. You can go back all the way to westerns with the a stranger walking into town, uh, f- fixing problems, and walking out again. That that's basically. You can go back the further Ma- to the Mandalorian. Yeah, you can go back further into Japanese literature, you know, with with uh, Ronin uh, characters doing the same thing. So that that is a trope that has been around for decades, hundreds of years. Um, now Lee Child obviously has, has popularized that in in a way that I don't think has been um, done before, in the sense that it, that character now is is a, is a byword for that genre. Um, but I, I'd read a few books before I wrote Milton, but I, I, my real inspiration for him would have been Elmo Leonard and and those kinds of um, the Clint Eastwood westerns and, and things like that. So obviously we, we're pulling from the same kinds of um, sources of inspiration. Um, but yeah, he's a great writer and it does get lost sometimes. And there's a bit of snobbishness sometimes about genre writing, but there is a, there's a massive talent in being able to write books that are compulsive. And, and the... The proof of the pudding for him is, is as I said, it's that he sells a book every 20 seconds and he's made millions and millions of dollars through writing 20 books, 20, a bit more than that now, 23, 24 books about this same character, doing a very similar thing most times, um, coming in, fixing problems and clearing off again. And, and but people keep going back to it because um, you know, Reacher is a is a very uh, well-defined character and he, he fills a need for lots of readers i know uh, i you know we, we probably all had moments where we wish there's a bit more of a reacher uh in us when it comes to um problems that we, we might have to face now and again that's what i do at weekends i just wander up to a dusty mm-hmm. town with a tumbleweed going through it and announce my presence and or in actually, in I, don't, I, I don't uh i don't announce my presence the the problems come to me they look for me, Mark. It's not the other. I don't look for them. Right. right. Okay. Sometimes you just have to. You know, you can't. You can't walk away. So, so. that so the ad the ad um, in the Godmanchester Express. The um, I don't know if they're. I'm not sure what your local paper was called, but you know, near, what's that equalizer um, ad? Um, got a problem? Need help? Oh yeah. Call, yeah. call Alan Partridge. <laughs> there you go. The, the Hunts Post. The Hunts Post. Yeah, in the classifieds. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was a thrill meeting Lee Child and Harlan Coburn. Oh my God, I just can't get say his name. I'll say it. Harlan Coburn. It's really, really weird. I've got it uh, transposed own, in my own, mind. Only for you. Only for me. Thank you. Um, good. And uh, we should say before we move on to our final item uh, in this show that if you would like to hear somebody in particular, uh, do let us know. You can drop us a line at support at selfpublishingformula.com or mark at selfpublishingformula.com if you want, and just give us your suggestion. And if you know somebody famous who's a writer, we should get somebody famous on again. We do have famous people on from time to time, but I know it's a draw. Okay, 
So finally, behind the scenes, so somebody posted a few weeks ago on Facebook and said, could you tell us how you put the show together? And actually, it's quite complicated how the show is put together. And so I thought, do you know what? I'll film everything we do for one week, more or less one week, and we'll put something together. And I've asked the team behind to do a little bit of filming of what they do. Um, the best prize goes to, actually, I'll say afterwards who the prizes go to, but um, this is a short video best watched but you can just listen to it if you like on how we put a single episode of the self-publishing show together this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer it starts with us thinking about who and what to feature in the episodes this involves a meeting i love meetings tom contacts potential guests and subtly vets them before sending a link to an online calendar for them to choose an interview slot i use acuity for this i block out monday tuesday and wednesday for a max of one interview a day Acuity automatically sends emails to the guests telling them everything they need to know. In return, it gets them to fill in a brief form and those details go straight into our calendar entry. At the appointed time, I send them a Zoom link. To record the interviewee, I use an iMac running Telestream ScreenFlow. This literally records what's on the screen so I make sure that the Zoom picture is nice and big. I record the sound output from the interviewee separately by running a cable from the iMac headphone jack to a Zoom digital recorder. Now I use the F4 multi-track field recorder, but you can get cheaper portable versions that do the same thing. To record my end, I use a Sony A7 DSLR camera for the video mounted on a tripod behind my monitor. This produces a clean, crisp picture. It records directly onto an SD card, uh, but I also use a mini HDMI lead attached to one of my monitors so I can check the picture during recording. Now, the DSLR is rubbish for sound, so I record directly into the Zoom recorder using a Shure SM7B microphone. This is widely used in the podcast and music industry. The mic has something called an XLR output you might not be familiar with. Apparently, it's higher quality and it goes straight into the Zoom recorder. I record the two audio tracks separately. This helps us during the edit to ensure the sound levels are matched between me and the interviewee. I also use the Zoom conferencing software record function as a backup just in case either the screen flow or the DSLR fail. I then record the interview. To do this, I read the notes provided by the guests which are in the calendar. I look at their books, Google their name and do any other light research on the subject we're planning to discuss. I tend not to make notes ahead of the interview unless it's during the interview itself and I'm worried I'll forget to ask something. Number one tip from me for a good interview is to listen to the answers and make it a conversation that flows. If a question pops into your head, ask it. It's probably popped into the heads of your listener. After the interview's finished, I export the screen flow to an MP4 video file and then put it in a folder along with the two audio tracks and the DSLR footage. We use Adobe Premiere Pro to join it all together. I used to do this all by myself, but now we use John Stone. John, JD and I run a video production company together and John is the video editing guru of the team. John receives everything via the Dropbox folder. It's actually fairly easy to sync the various elements of the recording. You can do it manually or use some of the automated syncing features that Premiere Pro now comes with. The interview is top and tailed and any bits we need to cut out are cut out. Tom will then watch the interview and start to prepare notes for when we're going to use it. Tom will be in charge of writing the emails and copy that go along with the episode. The interviews may sit in a folder for a few weeks before we're ready to use them. Each Thursday or Friday, Mark and I record the wrap that goes before and after the interview. Hello James, I'm right in front of the microphone now. The recording is a video, yeah? Oh, the sun's just gone in. Before recording, I'll read Tom's notes on the interview as it may be some time since the recording. Catherine Matthews provides us with a list of the new Patreon subscribers and MD and I decide what we're gonna talk about before the interview itself. We record the rap in the same way as we do the interviews, but if Mark's in his office, he too records his video using a DSLR and separate audio. If he's at home, as he was through COVID, we use Zoom at his end. In the old days, we occasionally recorded out and about in person. Hopefully, we'll do that again soon. We're live. And hangover. Well, one of us is. 
I'm extremely hungover. Um, John Stone then stitches everything together and adds the intro and outro beds. And hey presto, we have the finished content. On this edition of the Self Publishing Show, we accept less the than file is then uploaded to a service called Libsyn. This is done by Stuart Grant. Libsyn distributes the podcast to all the usual platforms Apple, Spotify, etc. It's also uploaded to YouTube and set for a premiere release on Friday. Stuart also posts it on Facebook during the week. Meanwhile, Tom produces the copy and John Dyer organises the artwork that goes along with the release of the episode. The artwork is done by Sarah Cattle at Cattle Brands Studio. Check her out on LinkedIn. Once we have the finished, cut, polished episode, it goes once again to Catherine Matthews, who lives on a farm in the middle of nowhere and is grateful for the distraction. Oh, hello, self-publishing show friends. I'm Catherine from SBF and I'm part of the team that helps put the podcast together every week. Um, and it is my job to proof the podcast once John has edited it. So part of my job is to check that Mark and James aren't waffling on too much. Well, James mostly. Cut anything out that is dodgy and then order the transcript, which then passes on to Alexandra, Stuart and John, who do all what they need to do. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Catherine. Alexandra Amore, based in British Columbia, will prepare the show notes. These are a vital part of the process. They help our SEO and are very useful to listeners who wish to follow up on the subject. Once everything is ready, John Dyer supervises the release of the episode each Friday. And that, my friends, it's that. It's a bit of a treadmill. Every week I have to record fresh interviews and every week it's all hands to the deck to make the episode live. It's a team thing. We hope you enjoy the end result. is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Okay, top prize goes to Catherine, who did a piece to camera explaining what she did. And the booby prize goes to Tom, who <laughs> produced four seconds of him sitting in front of a laptop going like that or something. <laughs> and I had to use it twice. Oh, dear. I hope there's no pornography on his on his screen when he, uh, <laughs> he filmed it. Wouldn't surprise me. He's in filthy. the attic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's what goes together, and people do not realise do this. So same with everything, I suppose. You know, you sit there and you watch Jeopardy or pointless game shows, and there's this massive team of people who have to turn up for work with all various skill sets to produce half an hour of what looks like fairly simple television. And even this podcast is the same. There's a team of people behind who who spend a, a reasonable chunk of the week working on this show. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be you doing everything. Yeah. Then I almost died yeah. doing that. Yeah, I do remember that. And actually, by do say all, all seriousness, I think that's the way, looking at the way we run our in publishing businesses is a good tip for me and something I do, and I think you do this as well, is you do master something yourself before you hand it over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I feel very uncomfortable just hiring somebody to do some work that I couldn't do or, or have no clue about how it works. Um, it, you're a better manager of those people, a manager of the resources you've got if you do it yourself. So, yeah, I have done pretty much every job in this show you have you've never yeah. edited an episode yet have you no i just turn up and um waffle on for 10 minutes and then go away again so no i don't do very much when it comes to putting the show together it's mostly i have to say props to you james you've been doing you know 300 episodes we haven't missed one um which we is haven't. that's that's impressive and also you i know when you, you when i look at podcasts and I, now and again people ask me to go and, on podcast things and you get that too now and one of the things to check is how many episodes have they got so you know it because it's quite easy to do a podcast episode, or it's quite easy to do 10, say, but then a lot of podcasts drop off after 10 or 11 episodes. And then you've got people like Joanna Penn, a friend of the show, who's must be coming up towards 500 now. Um, but, you know, there are others. We mentioned SPP earlier. I don't think they do it anymore. I think they, I don't think they do any podcasts now. At least I. Well, they did a series mm. recently, but it was always going to be a limited series of sort of status six, check of the industry. Six months ago, maybe more than that. In fact, I think yeah. it was more than that. So, maybe a year ago, yeah. So they, I don't think they do it anymore. They've been, you know, as when we started, it was rocking self publishing, the one I listened to when I got started. Um, Simon Whistler did that now, no longer yeah. with, no longer producing that podcast. Um, you know, there are some that come and go, but it, it does take quite a lot of um, stamina and stubbornness mm. to, to show up every week 
And you're, you know, you're you're doing all the interviews. I don't I don't do the interviews. You, you're, you're, we used to yeah. do them in the early days. We did them together. Yeah, didn't we? we did, but they were complete shambles um, <laughs> because we were just talking over everybody. And I'm not an interviewer. You're very good at that. So, um, Thank you. so yeah, it's it's it's. I think it's pretty impressive to do it for 300 shows, never missed one week. Um, I think we deserve a pat on the back for that. Well, mostly you, yeah. you do. Right? It's easy for me, but um, I, it's it's quite impressive to to have done that for so long. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, should we take a week off? Better not. No, I mean, no, and, no. And, I mean also, I don't know. We, we've we must be getting close now to three million listens. Um, yes, so we're, we're two point seven or something at the uh, minute. Yeah, yeah, over two and a half. Um, and and you know, our, our listenership is. I, I've spoken to Joanna, who's you know actually this week we had a little chat with her, and um, we we have about the same in terms of the the amount of listeners, and she's been doing it for ages. So yeah, um, well, we've been doing it for ages too. But it, it is it's lovely to. Um, to have have that and and it gives us cool and weird moments in lifts in conferences yes when people come up to you and go oh, are you james blatch because they recognize your voice they might not <laughs> yeah. may not have seen your picture before but they they know you from from your voice um and i i, I have that too which is is a bit strange but very very nice all the same yeah it is lovely and don't uh don't hesitate to ever come up and, and talk to us we always love hearing from uh, from you uh, when you're listening and two, i love hearing two stories meters of, two meters two meters as well i forget that now um i love hearing stories of, of of people's routines that they always on their dog walk uh plug us in or they're in the gym and that's you know in my mind that's that's when we're recording this when we're recording the interviews that's what i'm listening to somebody's taken some effort and time to listen to the show and they deserve to learn something and, and grow a bit as an author in the process we still get the odd complaint about how much we waffle at the beginning but then normally there's love, 10 people who say they love they this show yeah <laughs> 10 people who well, say that they really the, enjoy um, the bit and actually I think, never ends on the comment yeah. <laughs> i do i remember there was one recently where i i made particular effort to make sure that our, our talk at the beginning was relatively structured and it was like 13 minutes and we had several points to talk about all of relevant interest in the industry and someone still said the actual show starts at 17 minutes when the interview starts i thought no it doesn't because we had stuff of relevance. Anyway, ignore those people. Um, well, they're still listening, aren't they? Which is the weird thing. Well, who knows? Probably yes. Yeah, well, they still people. Just some people just like to complain, and that's fine. They can complain if yes. they want. Um, you know, that's that goes to the territory. They can. Yeah. So do um, do drop us a line if you've got some something you'd like us to cover. And Mark and I could do an episode. We haven't done one for a while. Actually, we've just focused on something like Facebook ads or Amazon ads or some some area that uh, that. Mark in particular has as expertise uh, or some area of writing that you don't think we've covered enough on the show. We do expand our, our coverage. Self-publishing formula as an organization is really about marketing, but the show is about all aspects of writing life. Um, and uh, yeah, we're de definitely open for ideas. And we should say a huge thank you to the team behind the scenes who you featured in that video. So John Stone, who edits every week, sits down in front of his, his editing machine. Catherine Matthews does a lot, as you saw in the video each week. Stuart Grant makes sure it goes online. Uh, Tom Ashford, who does all the copy and writing and helps sort out the interviews for me. And John Dyer, who really is the boss behind the scenes of the show. He coordinates it. I know we, we mock him because that's how we are. We're open to bants. But John is the person who makes sure that uh, everything is um, is in order and ready to go and make sure the show is live on a Friday. Have I missed anyone else? Our Alexandra Amore in Canada does the show notes. I think that might be it. I think that's it for now. Um, yeah, so thank yeah. you very much indeed for that team. And thank you very much for listening. Episode 300, we'll be back for episode 400 in two years. How good is my maths? Look at that straight off my head. Um, and between now and then, we say goodbye and look forward to another good interview next week. We do. Hey, who is it? Do you know? Uh, I do know. Well, I can't remember who it is. It doesn't it's, matter. Uh, it's it's Car it, it, it Car a surprise. Is it, is it Carlin Hoban? <laughs> it's Carlin Hoban. <laughs> Carlin Hoban, famous author, will be coming on the show next week to talk to James about how to butcher his name several I different might, ways. I might start writing as Carlin Hoban. See if yeah, I get away I, with it. I think it's it's a great idea. Can't possibly go wrong. I, I can't think see we any have, dangers there. I think we have Ros Morris next week. Very good. So we had Ricardo last week, didn't we? It's all complicated because we do this a week ahead. I think it's Ricardo today. It's Ricardo. Been Ricardo. Rick, oh, Rick, Ricardo. Yes. Yeah. That's that's today. As as we record yeah. that, that's not, going out not today. Not Daniel Ricardo, the Formula One driver, but Ricardo Fiat. No. Exactly. Yes. Um, Spanish good. Jesus. We are, 
We are officially waffling now. So Yeah, definitely waffling. Yeah. So we can wrap it up. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show.